In Paris, there is an area that used to be called the New Athens because of the number of artists there. As well as painters and writers, it was an area popular with prostitutes who plied their trade in the shadow of the church of Notre Dame de la Rette. But there was also a more respectable element, including bankers, such as Auguste Degas. On July the 19th, 1834, his son was born there, Hilaire Germain Edgar. While he was still a child, Edgar moved with his parents from the Saint-Georges district of Paris to the area of the Luxembourg Gardens, to what was then Rue de l'Ouest, now Rue de Sass, and then on to Rue Madame. His mother died shortly afterwards, in 1847. It's hard for us to know the effect this had on the young Edgar. He seldom mentioned her in later life, whilst he frequently liked to talk about his father, his dear papa. At school, Degas was an average student, but he was often described as uncommunicative and in the clouds. He received decent grades in drawing, but other pupils did just as well, if not better. Nothing would have made one think here was a painter of genius in the making. However, after completing his schooling, Degas decided on a career in art, and on the 7th of April, 1853, a few days after leaving school, he was given permission to copy at the Louvre. We are still unsure why he chose his path so quickly, but it was a decision that would affect the history of art. It wasn't long before the young Degas began attending classes with the painter Louis Lamotte. In 1855, he was admitted to the prestigious École des Beaux-Arts, coming 33rd in the entrance competition. It was around this time that Degas met Ingres and followed the latter's advice when he told the young painter, after seeing some examples of the work of Degas, never from nature, young man, always from memory and the engravings of masters. With this and other advice, Degas sought to capture in the work of his predecessors the correctness of expression, the right formula, the technical secrets he wanted to incorporate in his own paintings. He distilled from these masters the inevitable biases that are the foundation of an artist's work. In the late 1850s, he used pencil to copy a chalk drawing, portrait of a young woman, attributed to Leonardo da Vinci. He did this time and again, not just copies or dull reproductions, but subtle variations on an old theme. In 1856, Degas decided to spend some time in Italy. In Rome, he put portraiture to one side and opted for more conventional studies. History paintings which were never completed, paintings of local people and copies of old masters. Through an artist he met around this time, Gustave Moreau, Degas was to be introduced to the work of Delacroix. It was this that added an appreciation of colour and movement to the reverence he already had for the style of Ingres. With this hunger for work and the assiduous study of other painters came a great deal of self-doubt. He had a tendency to doubt everything, including himself, to jump into projects, only to leave them just as quickly. But, just as he was complaining about portrait painting being boring, he finished one of his most important oil paintings at the time, Family Portrait, later renamed the Belili Family. Belili Family is an interesting painting in the context uh, of 19th century art. It's, on one hand, it's a, 
a very uh, traditional conversation piece, a family conversation piece. If we then begin to analyse it in terms of the relationship to the guy himself, this of course is uh, his own family, the uh, paternal side of his family, Italian. And uh, it, it's quite clear that as one begins to look at it, the, the careful composition is actually telling us about the relationship uh, within that family. It is here that Degas begins to show a taste for domestic drama, a tendency, as the writer Paul Jameau put it, to lay bare the hidden bitterness between figures, even when they seem to be presented to us as merely portraits. In this painting, one would expect to see um, happy, smiling faces. Uh, what we see is the Baron um, virtually with his back to us. The Baroness, she stands in the middle of the room. Um, she's very erect, rather aloof, rather proud, um, and her, ch her children, her daughters, uh, are with her. His wife's expression is disdainful and cold. The little girls, I think, are fine, but there's obviously something happening between the two adults which is not quite comfortable. It would therefore give us an indication uh, that that family was not necessarily a happy family, a loving family. Uh, it was very respectable and to outward appearances it was very upright and honourable. In the autumn of 1859, the painter returned to Paris and moved into a spacious studio in the part of Paris where he'd been born. With a return to Paris, he also returned to history painting and tackled his largest historical canvas, the daughter of Jephthah, in an effort to emulate the sweeping works of his then hero, Delacroix. At last, Degas indulged in the delights of color, using unconventional juxtapositions of tone and scattered explosions of vibrancy across the whole painting. With another historical canvas, Semiramis Building Babylon, Degas employed another unconventional technique with his use of essence, which is oil paint from which the oil has been blotted and thinned with turpentine, then applied to woven paper mounted on canvas. He tends to use this word painting essence. Uh, now, in fact, this was a, a sort of um, method he adopted uh, to dry out the liquid oil paint. Um, that is, he, he soaked off uh, excess, what he considered excess oil, uh, out of the oil paint, leaving what we call a short, very sticky, stiff thing, uh, which you could then apply. And indeed, in some ways, you can't, until you look up closely, you can't tell the difference between pastel and this dry, short uh, oil paint. Degas used colour differently from the other Impressionists. His use of colour is restrained in his ballet dance dancer pictures, the ones of the 70s. He used white, sometimes pink, sometimes a little touch of pink or a little touch of red, and that could be the only bright colour in the whole painting. When he did his outdoor paintings, for example, with the racehorses, the, the colours there could be very, very strong, but again, he didn't use a lot of colours. It wasn't until he started doing his pastels in the later part of his life, in the 80s and 90s, that he really went wild with colour. Between 1859 and 1865, Degas turned out an enormous volume of work, which, nevertheless, left him feeling that he was not progressing. He became completely taken up with his art, which left him seeming aloof and grumpy. His impatience with people was becoming legendary even then. And then, around 1865, things started to change. With his painting, Scene of War in the Middle Ages, he was finally allowed to exhibit at the prestigious Salon in Paris, which he continued to do regularly until 1870. Apart from this canvas, he seemed to have forsaken historical paintings and until early in the next decade, 
concentrated solely on portraits. As well as his art, his friendships were in transition too. His relations with Gustave Moreau, one of his closest friends up to this point, seemed to have cooled, and he barely saw another close friend, Bonnard, after 1863. He began to forge closer links with yet another painter, James Tissot, who shared his taste and cultural background. But more than anything, it was his link with Edouard Manet that was to prove to be the most important for his future. It is understood that they met in 1863 in the Louvre, where Degas was etching a copy of a Velasquez painting directly onto copper plate. Manet was astonished by the boldness of an artist younger than himself and gave Degas some advice when it became clear the copy wasn't turning out as well as he might have wanted. So began an important and enduring friendship. Both Degas and Manet came from the same sector of society. They were both from the old bourgeoisie, the upper middle class. But Degas, uh, in the early part of his own career, um, worked rather in the spirit uh, of the Salon. He painted historical pictures. And when he met Manet in the Louvre, um, Manet introduced him to contemporary art, to the ideas of contemporary themes, so that Degas, in a way, came to the idea of painting uh, modern contemporary subjects rather later than Manet. Um, but his uh, sense of uh, where that contemporary idea was to lead him probably, uh, in the end, led him further uh, than Manet himself was prepared to go. It's difficult to weed out fact from fiction in regard to these two giants of late 19th century art, but their bond seems at its strongest in the 1870s. But before we get carried away by the notion of a mutual admiration society, both men were given to delivering cutting jibes about each other. Manet cruelly attacked Degas' lack of interest in women, while Degas criticised Manet's bourgeois tendencies, his ambition, and the celebrity he had enjoyed ever since the Salon de Refusé, an exhibition of paintings that had been rejected by the Salon. The relationship between the Impressionists was not necessarily very easy, and the relationship between Degas and Manet was a good, good example. Um, they certainly did um, uh, affect each other in the sense that they stimulated each other, but they also uh, at times argued violently. A theme which recurs again and again in Degas' work is his interest in race courses, which began after his many holidays in Normandy with his friends, the Valpinsons, starting in 1861. Their estate, Manil Hubert, was near the racetrack at Argenton, and the rustic setting reminded Degas of the English coloured prince he loved so much. Compared to his friends, Tissot, Moreau and Manet, Edgar Degas was a complete unknown, though he had achieved some note amongst other artists of the time like Renoir, Sesley, Monet, Cezanne and Pissarro, where he was known for his cutting wit and his uncompromising artistic views as much as for his breadth of knowledge. His salon exhibitions between 1865 and 1870 provided him with his only chance of public exposure, but the works he exhibited received mixed reviews. More important than this, Degas was not selling. Clearly, the institution of the Salon was not the right venue for his work. For him, the breakaway Impressionists' exhibitions of the 1870s and 80s were to be far more successful. Before this, the decade of the 1860s can be seen as a generally calm one for Degas. 
He was fully involved in his developing artistic style and had none of the irritations and problems that marred periods in his later career. His two sisters were married while his brother René moved to New Orleans, taking, at Degas' urging, his first cousin as his bride. Degas was still financially secure. His father's affluence saw to that, so he was under no pressure to sell. At the end of the decade, his art began to gain him a reputation beyond his small circle of acquaintances, and he began to actively push himself as an artist more and more. His brother, Achille, was delighted to report that Degas had shown his work in the gallery, one of the best known in Europe of a royal minister in Brussels, and at the same time, an English dealer, Arthur Stevens, approached Degas with a contract for 12,000 francs a year. Like Manet, Degas was testing out the English market as an outlet for his work. London had a very different approach. Uh, in one sense, the Royal Academy was not as strong as the Salon in its dictation of what was good and bad art. And they had already set up um, a number of uh, independent exhibitions, but also a number of independent dealers. Dealers not only set up in London, but they set up, they grew up in Manchester, Bristol, Norwich, Leeds, Sheffield, Newcastle, and they were serving uh, th this mercantile industrial patrons, the great cotton uh, owners in, uh, on the Manchester side and on Leeds, the, 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 te the textile magnates in Birmingham, the great iron masters. And uh, so London proved to be a very, a very important tapping into a network of, of patrons through not simply the exhibitions but also this network of dealers. There was a, a sort of English market uh, for Impressionist paintings. Um, rather interestingly, the main English market for Impressionist paintings came from a French dealer called uh, Paul Durand Ruel, uh, and he had a, um, a gallery in England. But Impressionist paintings were not really what the English wanted at the time. What the English really wanted was pre Raphaelite type paintings. It was more uh, the American market, for example, which became. Uh, the, the main market outside of France that the Impressionists sold their paintings within. As with many driven men, not a great deal seems to have filled Degas' life apart from his work. We are not helped in this by his famous circumspection about his private life. What little we do know, references in a notebook to being spurned by a young woman, references in a letter to his aunt about his wedding plans, and the opinions of others pose more questions than are answered. Degas had a very secretive private life. Um, he, uh, uh, he never married. He was always a bit of a misogynist. Um, he loved the little girls who he drew, uh, the ballet dancers and, and, and the girls who posed for him. But his own view of people uh, was always rather uh, acid. Um, he had a, a, a rather witty temperament. A painting such as Interior, also called The Rape, says more than any commentary could say about his shadowy, emotional and sexual life. In a young woman's room stands a man who seems to have no business being there. He has staked out his territory. His hat and coat are scattered throughout the room. She is slumped with her underwear half off one shoulder. In the centre of the room, in the light of a table lamp, are a pair of scissors and some white fabric spilling from a box lined with deep pink. Seldom has the loss of virginity been so graphically symbolised. It's um, a study of a relationship between a man and a woman, like the Bellelli family, if you like. And maybe it reflects on a situation that the sort of woman Degas was painting could find herself in. He painted prostitutes and lower class working women. I would hesitate to relate it to his own life. Where the painting actually comes from is a realist story. Uh, it's actually from a, a relatively little known novel by Emile Zola called Thérèse Racan. And the story of Thérèse Racan um, was by any stretch of the imagination 
uh, one of the grimmest and most uh, uh, cruel stories ever written. So that I think that, uh, in a sense, it was rather more an illustration of someone else's story rather than specifically uh, his own attitude. Degas' own lifestyle, his own way of approaching people, was rather distant and aloof, but perhaps not quite so aggressive that, uh, as one would get in a painting like Ray. In September 1870, Degas and Manet both enlisted in the National Guard, just at the time of the Franco-Prussian War and the famous Paris Commune. War brought tragedy. The painter Frédéric Basile was killed at 29, as well as Degas' friend, the sculptor Joseph Cuvelier. His death led to Degas becoming estranged from Tissot when he learned that the latter had drawn a picture of this young sculptor while he was dying. In terms of his work, though, the war brought about some good. Around 1870, Degas painted a portrait of a bassoonist friend with the Paris Opera surrounded in the pit by his fellow musicians. It's a good enough piece of work, but more importantly, there in the top corner of the painting is a brief glimpse of a group of people who were to dominate much of Degas' later work, ballet dancers. It's difficult to say exactly when Degas began spending so much time in the theatre, in its auditoriums and backstage. We know which performances he attended between 1885 and 1892, but details of earlier years at the theatre are very sketchy. He was fascinated with theatre, which I suppose there's something about his relationship with reality and imagination. And he got permission to go behind the stage to do, to do pictures of ballet dancers. Starting in the early 1870s, Degas turned out an increasing number of ballet pictures, some showing dancers on the stage, but more often in their classes. They were immediately successful. And it was this fact, as much as anything, that prompted Degas to paint so many of them. He wanted to catch them, in fact, not from the usual position of the viewer sitting down inside the theatre. He wanted something more personal in a way, something certainly more personal to him and to them. And he wanted to catch them unawares, which of course is a typical Impressionist aim to catch the passing moment. And this is what he did. Often, in order to achieve this, he actually distances himself and us from those dancers. We have sometimes a lot of space between us, an empty floor space between us and them, which, of course, does give us the sensation of being in the wings somewhere, watching something, rather than being involved with it. Unlike Monet, Renoir or Pizarro, Degas sold work often, but not steadily. However, the introduction of Degas' work into the market and the exhibitions he took part in led to a marked change in the painter's work. A small network of Degas enthusiasts was developing and a group of collectors was in the making. As a result, the artist paid more attention to career choices. His day was quite predictable. Work during the morning and afternoon, and at night he would go to the Champs-Élysées and from there to a cafe to hear some singing. A change to this routine was to come when his brother, René, finally persuaded him to visit him in New Orleans. Throughout his stay in New Orleans, Degas was astonished by what he saw. He took in everything the various shades of the black women who looked after the children, the houses with their imposing columns, 
and the twin-funneled steamboats of the Mississippi. However, instead of being inspired to turn these into what could have been a fascinating and unique series of paintings, Degas recoiled and longed for his cosy Parisian world. All I want now is to see my little corner of the world and burrow there diligently. But the exception to this avoidance of all things American during his stay was his famous painting, Portraits in an Office, more commonly referred to as the Cotton Market at New Orleans. In it, we see 14 individuals in the office of Degas' uncle, Michael Nusson, all of them busy with various aspects of the cotton trade, except for the painter's two brothers, who appear to be simply lounging around. This picture of a crowded, yet orderly office perfectly conveys his vision of America as a faraway land of tranquil prosperity. Degas got very fed up with uh, life uh, over there because he felt everything was based upon cotton. They thought cotton, they, they spoke cotton, they slept cotton. Uh, but what he's tried to do there uh, is to use and a, a technique he used often later on was an oblique angle. Instead of a straightforward sort of traditional perspective, vanishing point, single vanishing point, all these sorts of things, he was looking obliquely, above and obliquely, so he could take in a range uh, of, of the, uh, of the, in this case, the room, the exchange. The colour is, again, not a lot of different colours, a, a black for the men and a creamy colour for the background, for the paintwork. It's portraits, actually, as well, of, of people that he met there. He sketched, must have sat there sketching, and then he constructed this painting in his studio. Almost one could characterise it uh, as a press-type photograph. It's, uh, it has a rather high viewpoint, and the painting um, seems to split into areas of... Uh, white rectangles like the newspaper and books and uh, some of the cloth uh, against black forms so that the sense of a press type photograph of a snapshot in, of, in effect of life uh, comes out from the painting. Apart from a variation on the same subject, this is the only painting that Degas is known to have completed during his stay in America. Others, while possibly begun there, were finished in Paris. Now the long stays in foreign destinations was over. From now until he died, Degas would only leave Paris for his routine summer visits to Normandy or to the spas of southwest France, as well as the odd trip to Naples on financial business. On the 23rd of February, 1874, Degas' father, August, died. It would have a profound effect on the painter. Over the bed in his room, he kept a small picture he had painted two or three years previously, showing his father listening to Lorenzo Pagans singing a Spanish song. It's a moving picture, showing a man bent with old age, but still alert, sitting in the background. His father left the family firm in a sorry state. The impossibility of dividing the Naples property and the debts his brother René had incurred gave Degas his first financial burdens and forced him to concentrate on selling his work. His art now had to become a business. Whilst uh, the general uh, view of Degas is that he was independent financially, which is certainly true as he started off, uh, the family did go through some, his father went through some very serious times and in fact the family had to bail him out. In other words, uh, Degas now had to see his art in, in, in relation to, to an income. To that end, Degas was instrumental in organising the famous series of Impressionist exhibitions of the 1870s. He joined Monet, Pissarro, Sesley, Morisot, Cezanne and others to form the Société Anonyme des Artistes Pianteurs, Sculpteurs, Graveurs. Its objectives were to exhibit without selection committees, to sell the works exhibited and to publish a related art journal. 
though the latter was never to be published. At the first group show in the spring of 1874, Degas exhibited 10 pictures and generally received good reviews. The exhibition as a whole, though, was a failure. It received savage attacks in the press, had poor attendances, and the limited sales led to the collapse of the cooperative. Two years later, they tried again, this time at the Duand Royale Gallery. This time, Degas had 22 works in the exhibition. Again, the press was divided, but even his detractors saw Degas as the leader of a movement, as well as an individualist. The subsequent exhibitions of 1877, 79 and 80 showed increasing acclaim that testified to a newfound appreciation of Degas' art and to his special place within the group. Degas used a wide variety of mediums for his work, oil paint and the usual drawing mediums, but also pastel. Pastel allowed him to work spontaneously because it's dry, and he was able to make changes because it's opaque. This made it ideal for an artist who liked to work quickly, but who also liked to retouch the same picture over and over again. He began experimenting with pastel, and he started using very wild colours to paint his, again, ballet dances behind the scenes. And this may have been because his eyesight had deteriorated, so he wasn't perhaps aware that he was using such bright colours. What Degas did was he would take the, the pastel and melt it back down again. Uh, and very often he, he, he uh, would sort of boil it up overnight, turn it, turn it into a, uh, like a porridge, and use that as a form of paint. When it then dried, uh, it reverted to the texture of pastel, uh, but gave him an underpainting from which he could draw more pastel on, uh, on, on top of this, so that his, his use of pastel was very much more experimental uh, than had become hitherto. This powder of a butterfly's wings made it a perfect medium for portraying the elusiveness of subjects like cafe performers or ballet dancers. If there is a point where Degas becomes the painter of dancers, it is now. He turns out a large number of dance scenes using a wide range of techniques. He follows them backstage and into drab rehearsal rooms, away from the lights of the stage. He shows us dancers warming themselves, stretching, chatting, his observations were sharp and uncompromising. These were not great beauties. We see their chaperone mothers, dark-suited ticket holders, and the movement of tutus and the colour of the bows at their waists. I think that Degas saw in the girls some sort of kindred spirit to the way how he himself worked, that his work required uh, years of uh, dedicated practice before he could gain any kind of proficiency in it. And that was the same within the dancers. And he actually became a very uh, close friend to many of them. And um, they regarded him as a rather amiable, but perhaps slightly eccentric old gentleman.
In the course of the 1880s, Degas' life went through many changes. At the beginning of the decade, he was still weighed down by family debts. But by the time he moved in 1890, it was into a huge three-story apartment, complete with his ever-growing collection of old master paintings. But the 1880s also brought one distressing loss after another. Manet died in 1883. His friend, Giuseppe de Nittis, the following year, as well as a school friend, Alfred Neodet. During this decade, the Impressionist exhibitions continued and still stood as major events in the art calendar. However, Degas' role in organising them was coming under increasing criticism. Paul Gauguin didn't trust him and feared he might sabotage the exhibitions. His chief criticism, and one shared to some extent by Pissarro and others, came from Degas' insistence on including some of his friends in the exhibitions. As a result, in 1882, Degas paid his dues, but exhibited nothing of his own. And at the last Impressionist exhibition in 1886, he hung only ten of the fifteen canvases he listed in the catalogue. All ten, however, won great critical acclaim. A series of female nudes shown bathing, drying themselves and combing their hair caused more of a stir than Surat's famous Sunday afternoon on the island of the Grand Jet which we now hail as the jewel of the 1886 exhibition. Relations between Degas and his one-time co-exhibitors became more and more difficult. However, Pizarro's admiration for him stayed intact despite the many rebuffs, Degas' difficult temperament and the virulent anti-Semitism he showed in later years. Degas showed less and less enthusiasm for Monet's work, though, describing him as more a businessman than an artist and a man who turned out nothing but beautiful decorations. Degas, for his part, began to focus his art more and more on women. We see them trying on hats in milliners' shops, at ironing boards, in tutus on stage taking a bow, or backstage, rehearsing a step and fastening a shoulder strap. He painted them alone in their rooms, washing, dressing their hair, toweling themselves dry. We often don't see their faces, unself-conscious about their nudity, caught by the artist thinking they're unobserved. When Degas painted these women, his portrayal of them was considered cruel because they were so true to life. Some maintained, and others continue to maintain, that Degas was a voyeur who saw women as animals. His attitude to women seems to me to be disinterested in them as sexual objects. He sees them as objects in space, in movement. And this whole business of unchoreographed, that is what the photographer would say, that the, the, the behind the scenes, a snapshot view, something which particularly uh, appealed to him. Uh, and so his whole series of works on uh, women dr uh, bathing or drying takes people in, in attitudes which would, they would not normally be seen and indeed would not normally be exhibited. And it is this exploration of, of this that's important. He wanted to show the women he was painting as he saw them. His women in the baths. For example, the one where the woman is in the bath and you, you're looking down on her and you've got on your right this dressing table it sort of cuts her off. Again, he's separating himself and us from the woman and she is part of her background, if you like, part of her surroundings and that's what he's interested in, not showing her as a sexual object at all, just as a, a person. In the last decade of the century, the artist was slowly turning in on himself, opting for seclusion. From 1890, he began to see less and less of his friends, and in 1892 was no longer seen at ballet rehearsals. He authorised fewer and fewer exhibitions of his work, and through a bitterness with growing old, slowly cut himself off from everything. His work routine was much the same, however, painting in the studio until the evening, and then a plain meal prepared by his faithful housekeeper, Zoe Clozier. 
Sometimes he went to dinner at an old friend's house, and he continued to summer with his circle of old friends. Many old contemporaries died in quick succession, leaving Degas more and more isolated. Berta Morisot died in 1895, Toulouse-Lautrec in 1901, Gauguin and Pissarro in 1903, and Cezanne in 1906. His circle of relatives and close friends also shrank with a succession of deaths contributing to a growing solitariness. Then came the Dreyfus Affair. In 1894, a French army officer, Alfred Dreyfus, a Jew and an innocent man, was convicted of treason and sentenced to life on the notorious Devil's Island. The case became a major political issue for over a decade, dividing France into anti-Semites and royalists on one hand and anti-clerical Dreyfus supporters on the other. From the start, Degas was on the side of the royalists and did not refrain from making anti-Semitic remarks. Degas, we need to understand, was very right-wing and he was very anti-Semitic. And uh, the fact that Dreyfus, there was any indication that she, he was betraying his country, but he was also Jewish. But then he was found that it, that it entirely false. The accusations were false, or at least they were dropped, uh, which left Degas rather high and dry. The sad fact that he was indeed an anti-Semite remains one of the most disconcerting and troubling aspects of this great man. I think it did not reflect very well on him personally. But um, that was the nature of the man. This was the, the person he was, in a sense. And I don't think it, in a way, affected the relationship that he had with his friends. Uh, nor really did it affect um, any, any appreciation of his art or uh, uh, of, of the way how his paintings were beginning to sell at the time. During the 1890s, Degas channeled most of his enthusiasm into expanding his personal art collection. Such was his intensity for collecting, it began to worry some of his friends that it would lead to bankruptcy. He was purchasing the showpieces that would turn him into one of the most important collectors of his day. He bought Gauguin's, an El Greco, and work by Delacroix in a very short space of time. I buy and I buy, he said. I can't stop myself any more. In 1895, another enthusiasm took hold, photography. He bought a camera, most likely an Eastman Kodak No. 1, and used it with, as one friend put it, the same energy he put into everything he did. He used a tripod and glass plates, as he was not interested in the world of the snapshot. He photographed at night, after he'd finished in the studio which allowed him to explore the atmosphere of lamps and moonlight. His carefully positioned models would have to keep still for a long time in an eerie, inscrutable space, giving them a spectral-like appearance. Photography was something which, which was very important as the 19th century progressed. Um, it was seen as a severe threat to some traditional artistic things like portraiture, uh, and certainly uh, most artists uh, were, were affected by it. Some simply tried to ignore it. But others like Degas, and he was unusual in this, actually leapt upon it as providing him with even further information about movement. And this is the key to an understanding of some of the um, works that he was producing. What he liked about photography was the fact that it would catch, really catch, the passing minute. And so it inspired him, I believe. And of course, since he retreated to his studio to actually paint his pictures, he could always refer to photographs very easily, as well as to his own sketches that he'd done on the spot. Unlike many of his contemporaries, Degas constantly found the need to reinvent himself, to find fresh approaches to art, and to use unconventional methods of expression. His old age did nothing to change that. Like Titian before him and Picasso afterwards, he kept breaking new ground with works long considered unsettling. His shrill, dissonant tones would jump from his paintings in, as one critic put it, 
gleaming fanfares showing no concern for veracity, verisimilitude or believability. In a painting such as Russian Dances, he produced unorthodox colours which were, as he himself said, overwhelming. He repeated this with his last nudes and other dancer paintings. We see canary yellows, radiant pinks, muted greens and vibrant blues. His drawing was starting to show a form of expressionism. Faces lost definition as they merged into a sweep of coloured movement. He was turning his back on the realism of the 1880s. Now he had jockeys wandering about in vague country settings, which seemed to have little to do with racecourses. His line work became more emphasised and economical, often anticipating the art of Henri Matisse. Between 1912 and 1917, Degas was in decline. A friend wrote that he was nothing more than a wreck. He was slowly dying, losing his sight until he was, to all intents and purposes, blind. When he would go out, he could only go a short distance before turning back and would be seen standing outside one of the houses he used to live in, staring at it. But the house had been demolished and there was only an empty space but Degas couldn't see it. Edgar Degas died on September the 27th, 1917, and was laid to rest in the family vault in Montmartre Cemetery. His death was followed soon after by the sales of his work that began his immortality. One image, more than others, stays in the mind. In the spring of 1911, he went to the Ingress exhibition with his friend, Daniel Halivi. Nearly blind, he said to him, I can find something in those pictures I know. Those I do not know mean nothing to me. He kept standing there in front of the paintings, Halivi tells us, touching them, running his hands over them. An artist to the end. Thank you.